is so big but we only live a really really small part of that and that's because we limit ourselves and we do that with our mental health our mental health is how our mind works let's not over complicate this you know we don't have to get a clinical degree to understand that our mind tells us things and actually we can look at what is it telling us and is that true and do i want it to tell us something else Hey everyone, it's Carly here and you're listening to episode 17 of the Made For More podcast. And oh my goodness, I've got such a special episode for you today. So I've got an incredible interview for you. And this episode is so, so special because I get to interview my mum, my gorgeous mum. So for those of you who don't know my mum, we've actually worked together for years now. She also is part of the network marketing company that I'm with. She started just a little bit after I started. Um, So we've had the joy of working together for about six years now and she's built an incredibly successful business. But she had an amazing career before that. She worked in the prison service um, and she also worked in Broadmoor Hospital and she's worked in mental health for a really, really long time. She has amazing experience in that area. And I really just want wanted to get her on and pick her brains because there's a massive movement around um, mental health and there's loads of mental health awareness at the moment which I think is absolutely brilliant but the thing that my mum and I talk about a lot is that we're seeing so many especially young people kind of labeling themselves with mental health issues and taking it along with them as if it's like a life sentence as if you know they've gone through a period of time where their mental health has really struggled and now they have that for the rest of their life and what I the reason I wanted to interview um, my mum is that she's coached and she's worked with so many people and helping them with their mental health and actually helping them work through it so that it doesn't have to be a life sentence and you don't have to deal with that for the rest of your life. It can just be that period of time where your mental health was was struggling. So um, I, I love her attitude to mental health. It's a really positive attitude to mental health and a really kind of solution focused attitude to it. And uh, she's just got such a, an amazing way about her and I, I, lo- I just love listening to her. So I'm so excited for you to hear this episode. If any of this resonates with you, and I really, really hope that it does, you know, that the whole point of this, uh, the, I know that this is the same same as my mum as well, is that we want this message to hit people in the right way so that they realise that they don't have to carry this with them for the rest of their life and actually they can free themselves of, of mental health struggles and everything like that and we all have the tools inside us. So yeah, I'm so excited. If any of this does resonate with you and you or you're listening to it thinking, oh my God, my friend totally knows, needs to hear this or this person needs to hear this, then please take a screenshot, add it onto your Insta stories or send it directly to that person and share it with them because we really really want to help get this positive message out there and really start to create a good positive movement around mental health so as always the reviews and five star reviews especially really do make such a massive difference to the success of this podcast so if you're loving this podcast and you're really feeling like you want to share some love back then please hop over to apple itunes or apple Podcasts and leave a five star review and if you screenshot that and email me at admin at carlymyers.com then every single month i'm going to be giving away a free one-on-one coaching session to someone who has left that review for me so i really hope you enjoy this episode i can't wait to hear what you think about that's it. Enjoy. Amazing. Hi, Susan Myers on my podcast today. How are you doing? I'm oh, very well, thank you. Carly Myers. Ah, uh-huh. oh, delighted to be here. Did you ever think 33 years ago when you gave birth to me that one day we might be sitting on a podcast together? Funny enough, love, that never crossed my mind at that time. (laughs) Every day is a surprise, isn't it? I love working together. I love that we get to do this. And so much of, you know, I've spoken in my previous podcast about the influence that you've had on me in business and how much you've inspired me and just what I've learned from watching you. And so I'm so excited to have you on the podcast and just talk about your background, but also what you're massively passionate about now, which is mental health and really actually helping people through that, not just, you know, labeling someone with you've got mental health issues, but really helping someone, you know, thrive through that and make something amazing out of it. So I'm so excited to get into into all of that. But first of all, I want to talk to you about your background because me and you are, um, we're very similar in some ways. We're also very different in some ways. So the ways that we are massively different is that your levels of like risk assessment are like next level. I have zero risk assessment. (laughs) I'm not really onto that at all. I will absolutely smash 
a large packet of crisps in one go and you will eat three mini cheddars and then fold the bag over with a peg and put it in the cupboard to save for a later day. In that way, we are nothing alike. But in some ways, we are so alike. And that's in kind of like our work ethic and our business and the way we think about all of that. And I know that growing up watching you, you just did so much stuff. Like, you know, I I spoke in my first episode about where the fact that, you know, as a in my childhood, it always felt like we had loads of money, but we actually, now I know that we didn't have loads of money. And that's because whenever there was a time where we didn't have money, you were just like so resourceful and you were just adapted and you were like, cool, I'm going to be a dinner lady now, or I'm going to do a secondhand sale in this. And um, yeah, in that way, I think I learned a lot from you. So tell us a little bit about your background and I think so many people will probably be interested to know this because so many people that know you now see this um you know a very put together Susan Myers always wearing some kind of like lilac something with a pearl necklace and you're very well spoken however I know the truth of it don't I mum I know your roots mum she's a proper <laughs> Londoner she, she didn't want anyone to know but she's a proper Londoner so take us back to that moment and just tell us a little bit about your background um, oh, that's really funny that you say that. And you know, one thing though, just just before I say that, it has been brilliant listening to your podcast. And I would say it's so helpful for other parents to know this as well, that there were really hard times when you were young and Danny was young. And clearly we didn't, there was times where it's feast or famine, really, you know, we didn't have a lot of money at certain times. But it's so interesting to hear you as an adult not remember that. Because as parents, we beat ourselves up all the time thinking, oh, my goodness, this is going to change our child's life. You know, what will they think? And now here in your story, you don't remember those times. So I think, you know, in hindsight, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have worried so much. Um, it was the, it was the important things that we did, wasn't it? It was that we were there, whether, you know, we had lots of money or not. So, yeah, that's just an aside, really. Yep. So I was born in Camberwell, Camberwell Green. And um, my granddad was a um, scrap metal merchant, so a a rag and bow man, really. But I didn't realise at the time he was a real entrepreneur. And um, he he always had these businesses and Nan and Granddad had a shop. And my mum worked at the shop and it was the family business. And um, he had all of these other things going on. And he just didn't realise at the time that that was really entrepreneurial. And, And I... I do think I had a really good childhood um, and we made a lot out of nothing. So I was I was born in the 50s, 1958. And, um, you know, life was fun, really. But we lived in a tall tower block. Um, We, you know, we didn't have a lot of money um, and we didn't have a lot of treats, but neither did anybody else. So we didn't have that comparison at the time. And then we moved to the Elephant and Castle and uh, we lived there for, for years and I went to school there as well and we had a little garden it was like a postage stamp really but we had a garden like nobody else did and I look back now and realize that that was quite you know it was really really privileged but it was it was definitely tough and you you know we learned really to be resilient make the most of everything there and uh, I definitely was a tough little cookie because so my surname as you know Carly was uh, Boniface or Susan Boniface believe me being in the elephant, um, going to school in the Elephant and Castle and having a surname like Boniface, you have to be tough because children will pick on anything. So I really had to stand up for myself then. But looking back, I think that just taught me so much. I just, I just got to the point and I get to the point in my life where I think that is enough. <laughs> and, uh, and I come back from it. So I have always understood really that you have to bounce back from something. And all of those lessons now I see were really, really valuable. And I do have this grit inside me. And I I know that you and Danny have the same as well. Um, But it's just this grit that says, okay, let's let's find a solution to this. Let's find a way back. And my London accent is really interesting because when I started work, uh, it was really frowned upon. So for years and years and years, I would just try and hide it. But there'd be certain words that just completely through me and it it kind of showed that I had this this London accent but I was so conscious of it and I wasn't me for all of my career because I just felt that I had to speak in a different way and that was because you know I was brought up in London and I had this London accent but it wasn't seen as acceptable 
in the workplace especially not the professional workplace but now I know that's not true now I just feel so comfortable being me but um, yes that's pretty much my background Oh, I love it. I love it when your proper Londoner voice comes out. Sometimes I catch you. And if you call you as well on your on your voice message, there's one word where it catches out. You go, if you leave your name and telephone number, and you go, you are. And I'm like, there she is. There she is. It's the London Susan. I love it. Um, amazing. So I love hearing about your background and just, yeah, like I know, I know like, even your mum is exactly the same as well. She's like 80 odd now and she still does a school run. She volunteers at the... Um, food bank she just works and works and works still all the time doesn't she so we've always had that in our in our um in our bones I think so you obviously we talked a little bit about all the different jobs that you had and I know that even um bringing up me and Danny you had loads of other jobs you were never just like a stay-at-home mum you were still doing loads of other stuff and I remember once um I think it was a particularly hard time. You were driven to apply for a complaints job, weren't you, at Broadmoor Hospital? We actually live around the corner from Broadmoor Hospital. And uh, and that was the start of like a whole career in that area, wasn't it? So what was that like working at, at Broadmoor? Well, exactly as you said, though, it, is, it was a need at the time, really, because we used to have a building business, Dad and I, and, and we had lost that building business through no fault of our own. There were uh, customers that weren't paying and we had massive amounts of debt and we just needed to earn some money. And a friend of mine worked at Broadmoor Hospital and she said that somebody was going on maternity leave and they needed somebody there for um, six months just to cover this maternity leave um, in the complaints department, patients complaints department. So I applied uh, for the job and then I got the job. So I went there for six months and um, it was it was great for us because of the fact that um, I was getting a regular income. But the downside of that was that you were just about to start school. So the timing was horrendous. It was just not the right time. So there's definitely a lesson there. You know, it never is the right time. But that job that you know, that first six months really did change my life because it set me on a career in offender services that lasted for 25 years and had I not taken that at the time I would have missed out on so much um, but it really helped us financially it got us into a stable position um, obviously it allowed us to pay our bills really really gradually but uh, it was life-changing but it wasn't the right time and I went there for for six months and then I was offered a full-time job again had to make the decision to go full-time and uh, and I did that and I ended up staying working at Broadmoor Hospital for 11 years um, it definitely was interesting thankfully Broadmoor Hospital is nothing like it was in those days it was not a good place to work there was some challenging things going on and um, but now obviously it is part of West London Mental Health Trust and uh, part of the NHS it always was part of the NHS but um, yeah, a much better place than it was in those days. But it was it was a challenge that uh, I think just shapes you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Broadmoor Hospital, for anyone that doesn't know, is it's a mental mental institute, isn't it? Is that what you call it? Mental hospital? Mental yeah, institute? Well, it is a hospital. It's part of the NHS and it's for uh, people with severe and enduring mental health issues. OK, I mean, that it, it's the home to some of the most extreme cases of mental health isn't it like there is some crazy stuff going on there and I remember when it when we when I was a kid sometimes I'd ask you questions you'd be like um no I'm not going to tell you about that <laughs> and I knew that like I, I knew going because I could see a change in you I knew going to work the longer you worked there I could see it impact you and I could see your the more stuff you were seeing that was I think probably quite hard to see it was starting to impact you and that's probably why your your like risk assessment and everything is so high now because of what you've seen so I know you then went on to work in the prison service you became a governor of, of um, healthcare didn't you so you really worked a lot with healthcare and, and specifically mental health as well and that's what's become a massive massive passion of yours now um just give us an idea though of like what kind of mental health we're talking about because there's so much talk about mental health and I feel like it all kind of goes into one bucket now where someone says I suffer with mental health but what kind of mental health have you experienced you know what have you seen 
It definitely did shape me. Uh, you're so, that's so right. And and I have made some changes since I've left that industry, um, but obviously some of that is still there. Um, and, and part of that was because I saw things and the potential of what could happen. And I had a young family at home. So honestly, I really didn't want to let you out of the house because some of the things I'd seen and heard, you know, I didn't want to put you at risk because I knew some of the things that you know people can do to each other and some of the things that happened but you have to get that balance some somehow and and every you know lots of people do this every day they've got a job where they see things that are really extreme but they still have to keep that degree of reasonableness um in their family life but i mean the extremes that I, that I saw was at Broadmoor Hospital. Obviously, it's for severe and enduring mental health issues. So it's for people that are a risk to themselves and a severe risk to others as well. And so lots of personality disorder. So the real um, clinical need there, so, you know, where people, you know, unfortunately they can't live in society at all, and they have to have that security there to make sure that they are protected, but, but actually society is protected as well. And then when I worked in the prisons, what I saw was everyday people that were in prison for all different reasons. But then the span of mental health issues there were really from people that need to be sectioned under the Mental Health Act. And we were involved with that as well. So making sure that, you know, people needed more care, they needed more intense treatment, that they would then be transferred to a mental health hospital which again was a secure hospital but they would get that uh, real specialized treatment and then there was people that would have everything else including eating disorders um, but also um, anxiety and depression and I do feel incredibly passionate about this because yes I totally agree with raising awareness of mental health issues but actually it's not just one thing so I remember being part of a consultation group, a national consultation group, and there were some discussions about whether there should be specialist units in offender services. So should there be a, a prison or a unit that was specifically for eating disorder or for personality disorder or for anxiety, depression, you know, all of the different things, substance misuse, that's a really, really big issue. So drug and alcohol. Um, so should there be these specialist units? But actually, that can be one person. You know, one person can have a variety of different diagnoses. So to have specialist units, where do people go? You know, what is their primary um, mental health issue and what needs, what's the, the, the biggest need there? So it just made me aware that each person is an individual and it is really hard to just put a, a group diagnosis on anyone, on everybody. And also... You know, a diagnosis of mental health issue it does not have to be a lifelong diagnosis. And this is my key bit, really. I don't think people understand so much that as human beings, we behave or we re respond normally to an abnormal situation. So an abnormal situation could be um, bereavement. It could be loss. So you've maybe lost somebody, but actually you may have lost your job. You may have lost your lifestyle. You may have lost your status. You may have lost your house. You know, that is an abnormal situation. When I was at Broadmoor Hospital, I qualified to um, deliver critical incident stress debriefing. And this is a one-off session and it would follow a serious or untoward incident. So something had happened and it had impacted a lot of the staff as well as the patients as well. And critical incident stress debriefing is where you bring everybody together that was involved with the situation. And it may be that they had actually changed their shift and their best friend had been injured during that shift. And actually, that's impacted on the person that made that change. You know, we have all of this going on in our head where we say, oh, my goodness, you know, I, I was part of that. And we, it really doesn't sit comfortably with us. Now, if we don't do a debriefing about this, we carry that for the rest of our life. We have our own belief system about what happened there. And because we carry it, we can believe that it has affected our mental health and it will affect the rest of our life. But actually they responded normally to an abnormal situation. And it is so important to understand that. And there's obviously times when um, we carry that for too long and they may need um, some clinical support, some professional report, support. 
But in majority of times, we as human beings behave reasonably and normally to an abnormal situation. And it may be a health issue of our own and it throws our mental health off balance. But I coach so many people and I've coached people for years. And now what I'm seeing is majority of people come in and they've self-diagnosed themselves with a mental illness rather than getting clinical advice about, you know, is this something that needs clinical care? They're just thinking, especially youngsters as well, it is heartbreaking to see how many youngsters will say, um, I've got a mental health issue. It's like, no, you haven't. You know, you, this was not right. What happened to you was unusual. And it is right that your, your mental health is off balance. So let's look at how you know, we can work together and, and how can we bounce back from that? But diagnosing ourselves with a lifelong mental health issue is just going to restrict our lives. And when you're young, whatever age you are, but when you're young, you know, we don't want to be restricting our life. Our life goes in episodes and our mental health goes in episodes. So I'm so passionate about empowering people. And, and my, my role in my coaching is that I help women to find strength by taking ownership of their mental health. We have a role to play in our own mental health. We cannot leave it to others to dish out a pill or to refer us to talking therapies. We have a role to play ourselves. And if we can develop a toolbox that will help us each time we recognize that uh, our, men our mental health has been impacted. So we're just off balance. We're low in mood. You know, what can we do to help ourselves bounce back? Um, it doesn't always need clinical care. Obviously, sometimes it does, but definitely not always. Oh, it's so true. Oh, my God, I've got so much stuff that I want to ask you off the back of that, because I think that what, what's happened with like so much mental health awareness is that it has been amazing because people are now talking about it and people that were really suffering now don't feel shame to be like, do you know what? I'm actually really struggling, especially men. Cause I know a, a lot of men um, suffer with it and didn't feel like they could say anything, but exactly like you say, I feel now there's so much awareness about it that people will hear someone and say, you know, I get really anxious in, I feel a lot of anxiety in social situations or when I'm doing this, I, I get high levels of anxiety. And so then they're like, I have anxiety. And I know that me and you talk about this a lot. Like, you know, even though we, so for, for some people, they might think that we're both quite extroverted. We are actually both very introverted. And in terms of like big social situations and entering a room with lots of people, we both get very anxious and would actually really rather not do that and actually we talk about talk ourselves out of it quite a lot so there's there are normal levels of anxiety and depression and you know things like that aren't there so where do you think the line is where you're like okay this is this is a normal level of like my like my mental health is dipped I need to like I need to sort it out but I don't need to go to a get you know and get help yet and be on medication yet where do you think the normal line is so, uh, I remember when um, I first trained to do critical incident stress debriefing we talked about different scenarios and at the end of a session we'd always talk about what is normal and what is not normal so even not normal just means that you need some extra help so for example, if you were involved in a road traffic accident, so you're driving to work one day and you were involved in an accident and it really shook you up um, and you may have needed some hospital care, but it was it was unexpected and it really had an impact on you. It would be very normal for you in the future to for the next three months, maybe to avoid that road. So you would go to work, but you would take a different route. That, that would be really, really normal. If you found yourself and not sleeping, you know, that that would be fairly normal. But actually, if that continued past three months, and I'm not just putting a time scale on it, but, you know, if it carried on and then it started to really impact on your life. So you weren't sleeping um, and therefore during the day you were anxious, you were always tired, you were not functioning well or you were completely avoiding that road and you just could not get back to a normal routine that's when you need to reach out for some help. But in the beginning, 
it would be very normal to avoid that road. You're just like, oh my goodness, I still remember what happened there. But if it carries on, um, and that really is something to think about, if your life continues to be impacted by an event, that's the time then to go and see your GP and then just explain what the situation is. And it does not have to be really complicated therapy at all. Uh, you know, it can be just a short um, burst of um, help that you get some support for that period of time. So I remember I was, twice in my life I've been on antidepressants. So the first time was where we'd lost our business and it, you know, we were, were going to go bankrupt. We didn't go bankrupt because we wanted to hold on to the house, but we had lots of people ringing in and you know, obviously we had lots of bills that we needed to pay. You and Danny were really, really young. I had a really big impact on me. And I went to the doctors and I had some antidepressants. I had some talking therapy during that time. Um, and then the second time was a work related issue um, where there was some things that had happened at work, which really had a, a negative effect on me. And I needed some support then. But both times I went and got the support. It was an episode. Um, we worked through it. And I continued on. That is so normal. Most people I speak to will have a situation similar to that. It is very unusual for people to say, I've gone through my whole life, especially at my age, you know, I've gone through my whole life and I've never had any episodes like that. Majority of people will have had those times in their life. Yeah, totally. But I think that's the really key bit to say that it is a period of time. So like, yes, like recognize that you're in a period of time that is tough at the moment and you need a little bit of additional support, but then understanding that you actually have the tools and the ability to work through that and come out the other side. So I think what, what happens a lot is that people kind of, they, they stamp themselves with this label, which is, you know, cause they've had that period of time where they've really struggled. They stamp themselves the label of, I now suffer with it, with mental health. I have mental health issues. And then they carry that through the rest of their life. It's, it's quite a gray area, but I think definitely just being more aware and realizing that you actually, we, we have way more control over our mind than we give it, give ourselves credit for. And I just wanted to touch on um, the fact that you'd, you have been on antidepressants medication a couple of times in your life. And this is, I know that we've spoken about this before. This is where I think there's a bit of an issue in, in the system at the moment, because someone will diagnose themselves with mental health and say, I've, I, I'm suffering with this. They'll go to the doctor and the doctor will immediately, first of all, put them on medication. I personally think that medication is like a step seven. I think there's so many steps before that where you can, you can turn to, but I feel like the doctor goes there first. And that almost confirms to that person, I was right. I do have a mental health issue because now I need to be on medication. What do you think about the process of what the doctors are doing and how they're dealing with it? I think it really depends on when you go to the doctor and what stage you're at. So if you have left it for a really long time, if somebody's you know had this impact for a really long time, the symptoms that they're suffering from and the impact it's had on their life could be really, really extreme. And so when they go to the GP, it is very clear that they need some medical input. They do need some medical treatment just to keep themselves well in that moment, because the, you know, the doctor will assess the risk to themselves and to others. And their, their duty really is to make sure that the patient stays safe and the patient stays alive. So if people are talking about um, they have thoughts of self-harm, etc. Then you know there will be times when absolutely it has to be now. I do have masses amount of sympathy for the doctors as well because having worked with um, clinical teams, a GP just has ten minutes for each patient. That's what they're allocated. So often we're waited, you know, in a GP surgery and our, our appointments run late. But actually, ten minutes is such a short period of time to assess someone to um to diagnose them and then to treat them as well all in 10 minutes and if you're talking about mental health issues how do you do that in 10 minutes you know the gp has to make sure that when the patient leaves they leave in a safe situation with probably some ongoing care and sadly talking therapies the waiting list is absolutely huge. So I'm a trustee of a children's charity, children and young people's charity, and this is mental health counselling. And our waiting list is absolutely huge. The charity does an amazing job. But the waiting list is because the NHS just, their waiting list is just huge. You know, CAMS, 
um, and, and and NHS therapies that they're just so oversubscribed. So the doctor has a limited um, limited ha- avenues of where they can refer people to. And sometimes it is just about keeping them safe. It's not about what is good in the long term for the patient. It's what what can I do to keep you safe now for the next few days? And that's why quite often it will be medication. But I honestly believe there's a big part that we can play in this. Now, if you're not able to do that, and, and lots of times people are not in a good situation and they they don't have those tools to think, OK, how can I lift this? This is not going to, you know, I, I don't want this to impact my life. They're not thinking rationally um, and they need to be in a situation where they are. So that's where the GP will obviously get them to that stage. But majority of us, there are times where we are thinking rationally and we do need to think about impact. When impact happens, how are we going to bounce back? And, and I think that's where your podcast comes in and my coaching comes in and the Facebook lives we do and you know everything that we talk about is saying to all of us you know we have to do something ourselves so that when we recognize our mental health has dipped or something has happened to our life we can do something ourselves that can try and lift us and most of the time it will so I talk about our optimum mental health and we as babies we're born with optimum mental health in most situations and that is the time where we just have space in our head so something happens and we can process it we can think about what we want to do as a result of that and then we can take the action you know lots of times and I know on your podcast you've talked about being overwhelmed just so many thoughts in your head and recognizing that we've got those thoughts in our head and knowing that we need to do something different it's a big part of that. So you've given some really great techniques of, OK, how can we leave the things that don't need to be addressed immediately so that actually all we are trying to process is is what we need to do for today. So understanding that we all have optimum mental health and just knowing that it exists is actually how we access it, because we that's the stage that we really want to get back to. Having a a great morning routine is absolutely key. So I really just discovered this, I would say about six, seven years ago and understood it more. So bookending your day, having a great morning routine when you get up in the morning, doing something that puts you on a, a really good platform for the rest of the day and having a really good evening routine so that whatever happens in the day, you know, you wake up and you feel strong when you wake up because you've got this routine and before you go to bed at night that you have this routine. So it puts to bed literally everything that has happened during the day in most cases. So that's a great thing that we can do. That's all within our gift. But knowing that we can take control of this ourselves and not just letting things happen to us. And for years I did that. You know, I thought, Things just happened to me and I responded to them. But now I know that I can do so much more myself to take control of how my day goes and also how I respond to situations. Totally. And I think that is such a key thing as well to recognise before you even get to the point where you're struggling having a look at how you're living your life and thinking about how that's going to be affecting your your mental health because there's so many aspects of it isn't there you know like the the food that we're eating obviously our happy hormone serotonin is made in our gut so you know it's literally what's going on what's happening in our gut is creating what we feel in our mind so what other what other aspects can people be aware of that will really affect their mental health I mean, food is a real key bit as well. And I was on medication for over 20 years for migraines. And my mum had migraines. My grandmother had migraines. So I just thought it's hereditary. I thought I'm obviously destined to do this. I had a really stressful job. um, And I thought, well, this is it. This is just how you live your life. We have a headache every day and sort of three or four times a week you have migraines. That's, That's how I live my life. And then I discovered that actually it was food related. So I did a body reset Um, I found out what suited me and who knew it will just completely change my life. So I now know what trigger these headaches and of course I can eat them. And when my headaches start, I know what's caused it. So having that power inside me and that knowledge has been just priceless. 
because I can make a decision whether I'm going to have that food or I'm not. And if I'm going to have that food, then actually that is going, there's going to be a consequence. And I know what the consequence is going to be. As we get older, and I, previous generations didn't suffer from this. So our biggest fear at my age, so I'm 62, my, our biggest fear is that we're going to outlive our savings because my generation, we want to live longer, we want to live healthier, and we have the opportunity to do that now. We do not have to suffer in the way that previous generations did because you know they would eat comfort food, they would eat food that just sustained them really because that was their generation. Food was in short supply and you just ate things that would, would fill you up. Um, and sometimes it was not the best food. We're more knowledgeable now. We know what food really feeds our body well and what doesn't as well. And all things in moderation, you know, we live a really good life. So my husband and I, as you know, dad and I will go on great holidays. We've got a super social life, but actually we are more educated as well. So every now and then we would recognize some signs that do you know what maybe we need to make some changes for a few weeks and that's what we do and that's understanding the effects that food and nutrition have on our body the more we understand that the more well we can stay yeah totally I, I think the main message of what you say and I absolutely love it is just about taking responsibility for it you know if if what you're eating isn't serving your head then don't do it if you're like just binge scrolling on social media all day that um, it is proven to psychologically impact you. You know, it's a, it has a really negative impact on you. So you can actively choose to put your phone down at nighttime and have some, you know, a bit of a digital detox. If you're not ever getting out and exercising and moving your body at all, that's going to impact you. And I think that's the, 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 the main thing that of, of what I love about what you do is that you just teach people how to get themselves out of this. And it's not that you, I don't think you ever completely get out of it where you're like, oh my God, I'm fixed and cured forever. But you just, you teach people the the tools and the skills to just like, when they're feeling a little bit like, okay, I'm in a bit of a tough time at the moment. You give them a tool to whip out of their back pocket and say, try this. I think this is going to help you and just give them the awareness to help themselves out of it. And I think that's the most important thing, understanding that we all have the power to change our own mindset and yeah, get out of any situation that we're, we're in. And that's what I, I love that you do. I remember as well, when we were talking about podcasts as well, you was, you were saying, God, I've listened to some mental health podcasts and they're all bloody depressing. They're all like, I feel worse getting on those podcasts than when I went on it. So it's quite dark. Some of it, isn't it? Oh, it's funny you say that, actually. Uh, uh, you, you have just reminded me. I did listen to those podcasts and I am just a small voice, but I really feel passionate about this. When we talk about mental health, we talk about it in a negative way. But mental health is part of us. It's not an add on. We don't suddenly get mental health when we're in a bad place. Mental health is who we are and it can be so positive. And we need to be thinking about that. And I know that it's, you know, quite often in the media, what people are attracted to is some negativity. And that's why there is more of it. But we do not have to speak about mental health in a, in a really negative way. And just like I often coach people that have a physical disability, I've coached people that have had a stroke in the past and it has left them with some form of disability. The majority of time they will come to me and the whole first session, they are just talking about the impact of that stroke. I can understand that, but they talk about it as though it's their whole life. And what we do is we unravel that and they then start to see that actually it's part of their life, but they have a whole life outside of that. Our life is so big, but we only live a really, really small part of that. And that's because we limit ourselves and we do that with our mental health. Our mental health is how our mind works. Let's not overcomplicate this. You know, we don't have to get a clinical degree to understand that our mind tells us things. And actually, we can look at what is it telling us? And is that true? And do I want it to tell us something else? And it can be about, you know, a physical um, impact we have or a physical injury. And, and we just think that that's our whole life. I believe our life goes in episodes. And this too shall pass. So whatever's happening at the moment, we will move on from that. 
unless we hold on to it in our mind and then we never let go of it and then we never experience what else there is to live so it's so important that that message goes out now I am a really small voice here, but I am intending to just send those ripples out because the more people that start to share the same message that you're sharing, which is this is a good thing. It, it, we cannot stop this impacting on us. You know, things are going to happen. That's the reality. But how we bounce back and how we respond to it, that's something that is in our control. The majority of the time, we can do something about that. And the outcome of that, is a better quality of life for us and also the people around us because how we are has an effect on other people around us. Ah, oh, so good. I love hearing you talk about it because I just get so excited at the, the fact that you're just such a positive force in the world of this mental health. And I think the mental health awareness movement needs a positive force behind it because it's gone. I feel like it's just gone a little bit too too far on the negative and I feel like we need someone like you and lots more people like you to bring it back a bit and say hold on this does not need to be debilitating we can absolutely make the best of this and and change this so I love what you're doing and you do offer um one-on-one coaching like you said don't you and I know that um if the in the show notes of this I'm going to add the website and also if anyone is interested in having one-on-one coaching with um Susan my mum um then there is a special offer for my podcast listeners so I'm going to put all of those details in the show notes but um what I love as well is that this isn't coaching with with Susan is not about like a long term for the rest of your life you need to go through this coaching it's about finding a solution isn't it it's about actually helping people to get to where they need to get to on their own you're just there to facilitate it yeah absolutely I'm not into long-term therapy um it's, unless it, there is a clinical need and I keep saying that I am not clinically trained but I definitely have a skill about of, uh, to observe people and people's behaviors and because I have had the opportunity to work with a real you know big range of, um, of mental health issues so people that have had different diagnoses with mental health and also lived a normal life that I can work with I work with my clients and we look at what's best for them. And it's about giving them the tools. You know, this is, is not about saying you're fine, you're normal. This is about, okay, what tools would suit you that will really energize you and motivate you? What makes a difference to you? So this is, I do practical coaching that will help people to carry on their life. And when they they're impacted, they recognize that their, their mental health has been impacted. And then they, they can look at, okay, what can I do differently? That is going to help me. But because there is so much that we can do. And I have to say, I've had a really, you know, great degree of success with this. And my clients will um, be a testimony really to the fact that it has made a difference. But it made a difference with me first. So I'm talking from a position of you know, this is what happened. And I've lived a life where, you know, things have definitely not been right all of the time. I would say I've led led a normal life, really. Some things have really impacted us. And I've had to come back from that. You know, life is not good all the time for all of us. But we can't just wait for someone to come and save us. We have to do something ourselves. And when we've got that knowledge about what helps us, that's when we can say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to make a change now. So I would reach out to everybody and say, do not get to that point where you just feel there is no hope. Just make a change now and know that life can be better. Boom. Oh man, she speaks such wise words. I love it. Okay, so just quickly then before we finish, I just want to ask you three questions that I ask all of my guests um, and that it's like a quick fire round. So first of all, what does success look like to you? Success for me is definitely enjoying life. We are here for a reason and we are here to enjoy what we're doing. So just not wasting a moment of it and just embracing every new challenge. And yes, it, we can get nervous And yes, we can get excited, but that's all part of it, actually. You just know you're alive when you're feeling all of those emotions. Love it. What is your favourite book or podcast? You don't have to say my podcast. (laughs) So I've become quite spiritual in some of the things that I read now. So it, it, it does depend on my mood, but I'm a real Oprah fan. Oh, my goodness. I think she's just wonderful. And one of the things I always remember 
that Oprah talks about is your legacy is every life that you touch. And I think that's important for us to remember. So we can touch other people's lives in a negative way, or we can touch them in a positive way. And sometimes we never know that we've done that because they may not tell us and they go on and they live their life. But actually just knowing that you always come from a place of love, there is a chance that you are going to touch somebody's life in a really positive way. And that needs to be our legacy. Ah, oh, so good. And then lastly, who's your biggest inspiration? Well, I have to say Oprah again, but um, I just think, you know, people that are willing to give it a go. I, I just get inspired, not by people that, it's not when people fail or don't uh, achieve what they want to achieve. It's when they try. I just get inspired when people give it a go. And actually, when youngsters say, I'm going to do something different, I just love that because I think your life is going to be so big and fulfilled because if you're doing this now and our grandsons do this already at their age, I think, in my goodness, you're the life you're going to live is just going to be awesome because you are prepared to just try anything and as a result of that you will just grow and grow and grow I love that so good so if anyone wants to binge out on all things Susan Myers you actually do some amazing like don't be fooled by this 62 year old she's smashing Instagram she's smashing Facebook she's on all the Facebook lives and Instagram lives and she did her first reel the other day which I'm absolutely buzzing about um so where can people find you So I'm on Instagram, believe it or not. So Susan Myers Lifestyle. And I also have a website and my website is smyersconsultancy.com. Not original. I know that it's not all glam, um, but it's really, really practical. And that's where you can contact me. And I will definitely make sure that I get back to you. Uh, Also, I'm on Facebook at Susan Myers. Obviously, the same spelling, Myers, M-E-Y-E-R-S as Carly's. Just reach out to me. Uh, If there's any tips that you're looking for, um, let's just get in contact and let's start spreading the word that mental health is part of who we are and let's make it positive. And if we can start that ripple effect, um, it will give people so much more hope. I'm excited about the future. Um, I'm really looking forward to connecting with lots more people. I thoroughly enjoy what I do. This was not my retirement plan, but my goodness, I'm living a life that I I wake up each morning um, and I look forward to the day ahead. And that has to be your gauge. Do you wake up each morning looked at, you know, look, are you excited about the day ahead? If you're not, then do something different. It's all within your control. Oh, I love it. You make me so proud. I literally am just looking at you smiling. You make me so proud. You inspire me so much. And I'm so glad that all of my listeners now get to see how amazing you are. And um, yeah, just what an amazing role model you've been to me. So thank you so much, mum. I've loved having you on the show. I'm sure I'm going to have you on the show many more times. And I just lo- I just absolutely love everything that you're doing. Oh, thanks, Carly. Honestly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Absolutely priceless.